In our last lesson, we looked at how Beethoven used multiple tempo changes within one movement as a new and powerful expressive resource. Oddly enough, in instrumental music of the 19th century, apart from program music, this idea seems to have been largely ignored. The emphasis was more on new kinds of harmony and instrumental figuration. In the early 20th century, however, Debussy went further with the tempo idea. Here we'll look at the first movement of his cello sonata, one of six planned sonatas that he was working on at the end of his life. And these, rare for him, non-programmatic pieces, Debussy sensitively explores subtle, frequent mood swings. The formal results are very unconventional, but always convincing. In this movement, the tempo never stays the same for more than six or seven bars. While analysis cannot fully explain what I call the emotional logic behind the exact tempi that Debussy chose, it is possible to explain the transitions between them. To understand his technique, we need to look at the tempo changes in relation to harmony, texture, dynamics, and especially rhythm. The movement starts in D modal minor, with the piano solo that presents a couple of important motives. We'll call them A and B. The first one is a quick little turn around a single note, and the second one starts with a held note followed by a sixteenth note neighbor figure. The starting tempo is slow, the character very assertive. As the piano reaches its first small local climax in measure four, the cello enters forte. Its first few thirty-second notes seem to rise out of the depths of the piano, and then it takes over the foreground as the longer middle D arrives. The vibrato in the cello note sets it apart for the piano right away. It presents a variant of mode of B, but then, triggered by the piano's sforzando, speeds up into 30-second notes, plunging into the lower register. The great variety of note values in these opening bars already announces the mercurial character of the movement to come. The harmony for these last two bars has been modal, turning around the G major chord, which is really from the Dorian mode on D. When the cello has gone all the way down to the open G string, it changes direction, rising up and passing through the characteristic B natural of the Dorian mode at the end of bar 5. Then the tempo was marked Sede, hold back. The cello arrives at its high note, a surprising darker B flat, leading to a sudden change in the harmony. None of the notes in the piano part here, A flat, E flat, and G, have been heard before in the piece, and combined with the tempo change, they have the effect of casting a shadow on what we've heard before. Also, with the high B-flat, the cello's rhythm slows down, and the dynamics recede to piano. So the harmony, the dynamics, and the rhythm, and the tempo all work together to create this sudden change of mood. This measure is then repeated with the important B-flat held longer. Two bars after the C D, the music is marked poco animando. Now the cello lands on the high A, presenting a new motive, motive C, an upbeat followed by an appoggiatura. This motive, along with a variant of motive B, will dominate the cello line until the next tempo change, the C D right before rehearsal one. The piano texture here is much thinner and slower, just quarter note chords. The music seems to have settled down a bit after the wide range of rhythm and mood in the opening bars. In the following two bars, as the cello descends, the piano is further simplified into just parallel 6-4 chords. The descent and this simpler texture in the piano create a feeling of repose. Then the cello repeats the first two bars of the animando again, but this time pausing on an A-flat as it goes down. Along with the somewhat fuller chords in the piano, this A-flat gives the repeat of the mode of a darker color. The cello finishes this phrase with mode of C and B. Again, a C D underlines the modal cadence, D Dorian, once again. 
Notice the low D, a short eighth note in the piano, subtly giving the impression that the phrase is being interrupted. And indeed, the musical stability of the last few bars proves transitory. Although the tempo returns to the animando, the music's character changes. The cello speeds up, moving into 16th notes, and then some triplet 16ths, even a few 30 seconds. The piano also gradually speeds up. In the fifth bar after rehearsal one, the last three beats of the cello begin to turn obsessively around three 16th notes, C, A, and G, in the low register. They come from motive C. Now the tempo begins at eight bar at cellarando. Until the last bar of this cello rando, the cello keeps repeating motive C in 16th notes, while the piano accelerates in continuous 32nd notes, cycling around a diminished 7th chord in the bass. Then, in the fifth bar before rehearsal number two, the piano changes to a new eighth note motive. Slower than the preceding 32nd notes, it's now much more thickly scored than anything up to this point, although entirely in parallel motion. Parallel motion is a way of keeping the texture from becoming too heavy, as there are no really independent inner parts or bass line. Despite three little tentative crescendi, the dynamics stay quiet. Finally, just before rehearsal number two, both piano and cello explode into a huge crescendo. The cello at last abandons its three-note obsession, rising now up to the climax of the whole movement. The piano also reverts to independent part writing, emphasizing G in the bass, which acts like a dominant to the following low C that arrives at rehearsal two. At this point, the high point of the climax, the piano reaches its extreme low and high registers. The 5-1 bass clarifies the harmonic direction after several low A's. Combined with the cello line, rising at last toward its peak, the harmony also creates a potent buildup and release of tension. The climax consists of two waves of two bars each, starting rehearsal number two. The cello brings back motives A and B from the start, and then, ornamenting the same idea in the second wave, moves into 32nd notes. The first peak in the cello rises up to C, the second time, although faster, only reaches B flat. Then the cello descends, recalling the piano's middle part from bar one, motives A and B. The piano has parallel chords in the lower register, again to reduce the harmonic tension. Now that the cello is descended back into its lower register, it repeats motive A, but slowed down to eighth notes. This loss of energy is reinforced by another sede indication. As the bass finally descends from G to C, the cello ops almost seems to be improvising around its open strings in a bar marked rubato. It rises once again to the high A, and then a little burst of energy in 32nd notes, marked quasi cadenza, turns obsessively around a little scalar figure that lands alternately on E and E flat. The piano harmony, essentially a 5-6 chord of D minor, also alternates between the same two notes. 
both instruments first speed up a bit, then slow down within a bar where the tempo was first marked en serrant and then retenu. This is the final loss of momentum following the climactic passage. What follows now at rehearsal 3 is a textual repeat of measure 8 to 11. This repeat gives the form a sense of rounding off. Familiarity releases tension. Only the very last note in the piano part is changed from B to E flat so as to lead more smoothly into the final lento section. Now the cello repeats two of the previous four bars, very slightly varied. The piano here is pianissimo, but more fully scored. The next two bars are different. The cello once again recalls the piano's middle part at the beginning of the movement, reinforcing the sense of rounding off the form, although not in a mechanical way. The piano is now in its lower register, and its harmony ends up on a G minor chord here at the eighth bar after rehearsal three. This provides a subdominant before the repeated 5-1 cadencing that follows. The cello repeats the mode of A here for the last time before a final rise into its highest register. Although the tempo does not change in these last bars, the rhythm does, slowing down to half notes in both instruments. To make the ending more special, the cello has risen to its highest notes in the whole movement, a double harmonic DA. The piano quietly makes the final chord major, adding the F sharp. As we can see, the tempo changes in this movement are central to its mercurial character and form. The overall momentum is organized into several waves, culminating at the climax of rehearsal number two. These waves are not just simplistic up and down motions, but their overall shape remains quite clear, giving the music an organic breathing quality. The flexibility of tempo and imparts an almost improvised feel to the music. It needs to be emphasized once again that tempo changes alone cannot achieve this effect. Rather, what counts is how they are coordinated with other dimensions of the music. And that is what a sensitive analysis should attempt to explain, how all the dimensions of the music work together towards the musical result.